Our passage for this morning comes out of Mark chapter 10. And and today we're continuing our series better, and we have so many things that I'm excited about within the series. Uh, We we mentioned last week that on December 8th, we're going to take a special offering that goes to future campuses, future works that God is doing. And I had the opportunity this past weekend to spend time with our some of our key leaders in our church here at Beaver Creek, in Ironton, and in Fairborn, and it was amazing just to gather together in that room and to ask, where is God leading us? What does God have for us in the future? Where do we need to trust and obey him today? And I I can't wait to see what God is going to do. And and that's one thing. And and next week in this series, I want to I want to let you know this. Uh, You're going to hear from our high school pastor here at the Beaver Creek campus, James Mummer. And James, with a, with a son who has been in the hospital for all 10 months of his life, is going to preach on the God who is better than you expected. And I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss that. And I, I say that for your expectation, but I also say that to let you know that I'm not preaching next week, so I need to get all of my energy out in the moments that we have right now, okay? And so we're going to start right here. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says, Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus in this moment is not worried about what the people around him think, is not worried about social protocol or the status quo. Bartimaeus is not worried about what most people would do. He's not worried if other people are raising their hands. He's not worried if other people are clapping. He's not worried the decibel level that those around him is singing. He goes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout if I need to. And it's, it's actually uncomfortable. It says, be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him. You know what I hate? Oh, you know what? I hate being shushed. And I have a loud voice. I don't even need the microphone. I have a loud voice. And all my life, I'm in a restaurant telling a story, and it's a good story. And then someone will lean over to me and shh. I hate it. They shush him. Be cool, Bartimaeus. Chill out. But it says this. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. There's this moment that has to happen within your life. There's this moment that has to happen within your faith. If you want the fullness of what God has for you, that understands Jesus is passing by. And he is not going to pass by me without him doing something in my life. Jesus is passing by. And he's got work that he needs to do in me. And I'm not worried about what those around me think. And I'm not worried about what those around me say. Because he's passing by and he's calling me by name. And Bartimaeus yells all the louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up. They said, come on, he's calling you. And that is my message for you this morning. Life may have dealt you a hand that you did not want to play. The circumstances of your life may not have ended up where you wanted them to be. You may not have walked in this morning feeling God's presence in your life. And my call to you is cheer up. He's calling you by name. Lift your head, raise your eyes, fix your gaze on Jesus. He's calling you and your life is going to be different because of it. Turn to your neighbor right now. Tell him, cheer up. You look sad. Tell him, cheer up. Cheer up. 
Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. He says, go for your faith has healed you. Go on your way, go, go do your thing for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. He says, go, and Bartimaeus says, I'm going with you. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going back to what was. I'm following you. I believe God is gonna do great things today in your life. I believe with everything within me that some of you are stuck and you don't even know you're stuck. Some of you have been in bondage. You don't even really realize it in this moment. And today is the day that you are free. So cheer up. He's calling you by name. Amen. Can we celebrate in advance what we believe God is going to do today? Great things this morning. Great things. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. I didn't know what to title this message. And I need to confess, like sometimes I spend way too much time figuring out what I need to title the mes this message. The first title of the message was upon the part in the passage in which they shush Bartimaeus. I still can't get over that, that they shush Bartimaeus. Shh. Don't talk to Jesus. Shh, don't do that. That's, this is not the time. Shush Bartimaeus, and it says he yells louder. So the first title for the message was a little bit louder now. <laughs> I thought it was fun. The second title for the message was along the part where he, he takes off his coat. And so I was going to tell you to throw off your coat. I figured some of you, like, we, we turn the heat up in here. Throw off your coat. You're good. It's warm. You're fine. Uh, but this is what I settled on. The title of the message for this morning is Rent Crutches. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor. Tell him, Rent Crutches. I have some props. Today's prop day. Can I have, can I have the crutches? Thank you very much. These are, these are not my crutches. I rented them. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to be able to do that with two. Here you go. You can have one back. <laughs> He's healed, guys. <laughs> look, look at that. <laughs> You're good to go. <laughs> so, uh, and, and this is the idea, okay? If you're, if you're a note taker, this is, this is what I should need you to know. You should never make permanent what was meant to be temporary. You should never permanently attach in your life what was only meant to be there for a temporary period of time. It's there for a season. It's not a life sentence. Just because it's there in the moment doesn't need, mean it needs to be there forever. And when I was in middle school, I sprained my ankle, and it felt like death. <laughs> and, and I went in to the doctor and did all the x-ray and stuff like that, and it had to, you, you sprained your ankle. Thank you. I'm aware of that from the cantaloupe that is now in my ankle. Yes, I'm aware that that happened. And so you're going to need crutches. Do you want to buy them or rent them? Not buying crutches. Like, I, I don't need them forever. I just need them now. Like, I don't, I'm not going to need this in the future. I'm going to need this in the moment. And for some of us, what has happened is things that were fine and good and actually beneficial in the moment are no longer needed, and we still hang on to them. We, we take things that were meant to be there for a season, and we permanently attach our lives to them. And it's not supposed to be there. You were supposed to leave it behind. If I came in this morning walking around like this, which I'll just be honest with you, is really comfortable. Like, this is nice. <laughs> Makes me want to watch the Christmas Carol. <laughs> <laughs> that felt too much. <laughs> Didn't realize it until after I said it. <laughs> and you go, Kevin, what's wrong? I go, I sprained my ankle. When? Seventh grade. You go, what's wrong with you? Not, not in terms of my ankle. Like, what's wrong with your head? Why are you still on crutches? And I want to ask the same question of you today. Why have you carried with you stuff that should have been left a long time ago? Because what happens is, is we take things that are not even bad, we take things that were fine, that were even good, that were even beneficial, and we carry them with us. And, and there's maybe a moment in your life in which 
it was important that you increased your ability to judge others and their trustworthiness because maybe you've been betrayed. Have you been betrayed at some point in time in your life? If you have not been betrayed in your life, you are going to be betrayed in your life in the near future. It's gonna happen, it's a part of life, okay? And maybe you needed to increase your judgment and that was fine for the season, but now you just don't trust anyone. Maybe there was a time in your life in which you had to block out all the criticism so you could do the thing that you knew you were called to do. But what at one point in time was healthy and beneficial of blocking out the criticism is now you just don't listen. Now you just don't listen to anyone and you're unopened to feedback and you're unopened to see your blind spots so you can actually move forward. There, there maybe was a time in your life in which you needed to become less emotional in your decision making. Don't nudge the person next to you, okay? I'm just sparing you right now. You maybe needed to become less emotional in your decision making. And while that was good for the time, now you're just numb. And, and there's periods in our lives in which a relationship that was there was fine while it's there, but it doesn't need to be there forever. Just because someone has been in your life for a season doesn't mean they need to be there forever. Can I get an amen from someone on that, please? Four of you. We good. The job that provided security that was not meant to be your life, was not meant to be your vocation, you're hanging on to because you like the security. And it's a crutch. And it's not meant to be forever. I, I, I've taught two of my four kids how to ride a bike. And every single time we teach them how to ride a bike, we start with training wheels. Because it's beneficial in the moment. But at some point in time, what is beneficial in the moment becomes a hindrance in the future. It's fine in the past. But it's not healthy in the present. It was good in the present, but it now becomes a hindrance to what God is calling you to be. And just because it was there for a season doesn't mean it has to be there forever. Just because it was beneficial in the moment doesn't mean it has to be a permanent part of your life. And I believe the essence of faith is this. For most of us, what happens is we eliminate the things in our lives that shouldn't be in our lives when we can no longer keep them there. For most of us, we have to get to a point of a crossroads where we have to make a clear decision on our former life and our future life. But the essence of faith is this, is I'm going to get rid of what hinders before I have to. I'm going to get rid of what is keeping me back be for I am obligated to. When, uh, when my wife and I first got married, I played a lot of video games. Like a lot <laughs> of video games. And we moved in and we were at a small church in a small town and the church didn't have anyone our age and we didn't have any friends and so my friends were video games. I don't mean I played with friends while playing video games. My friends were the video games. <laughs> and there was, a, there was one Saturday in which I had been downstairs for approximately nine straight hours playing video games. And I needed to come upstairs to get some nourishment, to get some sustenance, because I was, I was wearing myself down. I was trying to run with perseverance, the race marked out for me. But I needed some Doritos. And I come upstairs and my wife goes, she goes, are you going to stay down there all day? I said, what else would I do? <laughs> Bad answer. <laughs> Bad answer. And, and here's the thing, I say this is, there is nothing wrong about playing video games. Play video games all you want. Knock yourself out on Candy Crush. Not now, but knock yourself out on Candy Crush. That's fine, go ahead. You're not going to find anything in scripture that goes, you shouldn't play video games. But this is what it was for me, for me, not for you, for me, is I eventually had to realize that, that God had other ways for me to spend my time. And that if I was going to step into who he was calling me to be, that that had to go. It wasn't wrong. It was just a hindrance to the future that God had for me. Does this make sense? Do we understand? 
I, I had a friend who, who, had a, who had a girlfriend. I didn't say I had a good friend, okay? Just hang on. I had a friend who had a girlfriend, and it was one of those situations where you knew they weren't right for each other. You have those friends? It's like, you're nice and you're nice, but this ain't gonna work. You're both nice, but this should not happen. And so there, he's in this relationship, and eventually I talk to him, I was like, dude, you know, like, this is not a good relationship for you. You know you should not, this isn't healthy. Like, you're not even, like, engaged yet, and you're already fighting like a couple that's been married 20 years. Like, there's, there's a problem within this. Something is off in this moment. And he was like, you know you need to break up with her. Was, he's like, yeah, I know. Well, then why haven't you done it? I'm just waiting to meet someone new so I'm not lonely. Again, I didn't say he was a good guy, okay? He's just a friend. Jesus was a friend of sinners, so was I. It's fine. <laughs> and, and he's in this, and he's going, I know this isn't good, but I'm going to hang on to it until I can see the new in this moment. And, and here's the deal with our faith. That's often where we are, is we hang on to our old life until we're forced to put it down. And we take things that were never meant to be permanently attached to who we are, behaviors, attitudes, addictions, guilt, excuses, and we make them part of our identity. And they were never meant to stay there. The crutch, the training wheels, can be there for a season. But at some point in time, if you're going to move forward, you have to let them go. In this passage, what we typically celebrate the most is we celebrate the fact that the man was healed. That this man, this beggar, didn't, didn't just want, this is amazing to me, he didn't just want a miracle, he wanted a lifetime with Jesus. And when Jesus says, go for your faith has healed you, it says he followed Jesus down the road. You can go now, and he goes, I'm gonna stay with you. <laughs> like, I'm hanging with you because I know what you've done. And we celebrate the fact that the man was healed and the miracle takes place, but, but I want to point out to you, I believe something more significant actually happens in this passage. And, and it happens right in here. In verse 48, it says, be quiet. <laughs> Many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. Now watch this. Oh, watch this so closely. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up. And came to Jesus. <clears throat> oh, I'm so excited. I've, I've got another prop. Where's my other prop? I got a coat. Can I have the coat? <laughs> Crushed it. So good. This isn't, this isn't my coat. I'm going to put on the coat. <laughs> Hang on a second. I'm going to make it sure I don't look like a hunchback. It's better. Oh, it's too warm in here. <laughs> he, he's got a coat. This is what I want you to see. His coat is his crutch. For the blind man, his coat is his crutch. Because the coat was used for several different things. The coat of a beggar, the coat of a blind man, identified him as a beggar. He can't beg without his coat. I shouldn't have buttoned it all the way. <laughs> I'll never be able to get it off. It was used for several different things. The first thing it was used, it was used to cover him. He can't beg indoors. There's no one walking past. He has to stay outside. The cover, the coat, is his cover. It is his protection for being outdoors. The second purpose of the coat of a beggar was to collect. He, he needed to collect money. He needed to collect tokens. He needed to collect things to get him forward in the future. And so he would take these collections and he would put them in the pockets of his coat. He couldn't just hold them there. This is what they used the coat for. The coat was there to cover him. The coat was used to collect what was given to him. And it identified him 
as a beggar. But the coat becomes a symbol for why he was stuck. And, and I want to make the case today that you have a coat. You have a coat that identifies your old life that you're still wearing. And this is what you do, is you use it to cover, to protect how you live what you do. You use it to protect your way of life. It's your excuses for your behavior. It's your excuses for why you are the way you are. If someone ever says about them, someone says about you, oh, that's just the way they are, it's not a compliment. Oh, that's just the way they are. They're always angry. It's not a compliment. Oh, they're just not trusting. It's not a compliment. They're really cynical. It's not a compliment. It, it becomes your cover. It becomes your protection. Why, why do they not trust? Oh, because of this. Why do they have an addiction? Oh, they went through these other things in their life and they have this past. And it's used to protect and it's used to collect. We collect sympathy from those around us. Can you believe they went through this? Can you believe their spouse treats them this way? Can you believe their parents act like this? Sometimes we would far rather have people affirm where we are than be transformed into who we were called to be, right? Oh, man, it feels better to have someone come up to me and say, I'm so sorry you're going through this, than for someone to come up to me and say, get up and go. There's something more significant ahead of you. And so we cover, we protect, we collect sympathy and excuses, and people will throw their scraps to us, and it becomes our identity. And what happens is, is the guilt that we hate, we don't know what we'd do without it. The anger that always sits beneath the surface that bubbles up when anything goes wrong because you've met this, these people or you are this person, right? Someone cuts you off in traffic and you go into a rage. Go, why was there so much anger there ready to come out in a moment? It's not from the car, it's from something else. You didn't get angry, you're like the Hulk. You're always angry. Like we, we have these things in our lives that stay there. The addiction that we hate still soothes us in the moment. The relationship that we need to get out of keeps us from feeling lonely. And we wear the coat, and it protects us, and it becomes us, and it has no business being part of our future, but we're going to hang on to it for as long as we can. What's your coat? What's your coat? What, what's the thing that you have taken security in? What is the thing that you don't know how to let go of? What is the thing that you cling to? other than Jesus? What is the thing that if it was taken away from you, you don't know what your meaning and purpose would be? What is the thing in your life that you go, no, 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 this is how I can rationalize my behavior. This is the excuse that I can make for why I haven't moved forward. This is the story that I tell to everyone around me for why things are the way they are and who are you to tell me to move forward? Man in weird camo sweatshirt and oversized coat who's getting kind of sweaty because it's getting hot in here. <laughs> Don't finish that. <laughs> the coat is his crutch. The coat is the thing that defines him from his past that he's still holding on to. And what we usually do is we usually wait for God to give us a reason to take off the coat. And we say, God, I will let go of the past, good or bad. We get that, right? The coat is not always bad. The coat is just something that is not meant to be a part of your future. The crutch is the thing that helps you in the moment, but is always meant to be temporary. And we say, God, I'll get rid of it, 
But first, you've got to do all these other things first. God, I will let go of this part of my life as long as you make all these other things happen in advance. And God will still work. And God will still move. But it'll take longer. God will still do work in your life. You can wear your coat and he will love you till the day you die. You can limp around with crutches and God still accepts you, still extends grace and mercy to you, still has all the forgiveness for you for everything you've done wrong. You will still have the depths of his love. But you will not step into who you were created to be because you're always held back by what you were. In John chapter 15, verse 2, Jesus teaches this, and I think this is such a powerful piece. He says of the Father, he says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. What in your life doesn't produce fruit? What in your life is holding you back from what God has for you? What excuse do you cling to, You do you hold on to, that keeps you stuck in what is happening in this moment? And we often say, God, do this and I'll follow. God, act in this way and I'll follow. God, if, if you make this happen, I'll, I'll be right behind you. But that's not what the beggar does. See, this man wants Jesus so much that when Jesus calls him by name and they say, cheer up, come on, he's calling you. In verse 50, it says, Bartimaeus, still blind, still begging, threw aside his coat. I go, wait, Bartimaeus, you're going to need that. You don't know he's going to heal you. And Bartimaeus goes, no, I don't. Jesus is coming. (laughs) Wait, Bartimaeus, hang on a second. Like, you're going to need that. You don't know. And he goes, no, 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 I know. Jesus is calling me by name. And I know I don't need this anymore. I know the old life has no business in the new life. I know who I was has no business in who God has called me to be. I I used to do this when I would spend all day playing video games. And I I wanna say this, and let me me give a waiver because I wanna make sure this isn't offensive, okay? Because if, if we take this out of context, this could sound very sexist, okay? I've got your attention. Uh, My wife does all the cooking, not because that's what she should do as my wife, but because I lack the ability, okay? I I took a cooking class in college. They had us make biscuits. Everyone else was done making biscuits in 30 minutes. They actually kicked us out because we had tried three different times and gotten the recipe wrong, and they were shutting down the building, and we never actually made biscuits. Do you understand this? My cooking class is the only C I got in college. It's not because she should, it's because I lack the ability. We understand that? It's not a statement of gender roles, it's a statement of my ineptitude, the fact that my wife does all the cooking. And and so uh, on Fridays, I I had the day off and my wife would teach. And on Fridays, I'd spend the entire time playing video games and my wife would come home. And from, from nine hours of playing Madden and just destroying people online over and over again, I had worked up an appetite. You understand, you get it, you get it. I had worked up an appetite, and so I would come home, and I asked her, hey, what's, what's for dinner? And she'd say, hang on, let me, let me make it. And, and that worked for a little while, and then she started to become frustrated, and she knew that I couldn't cook, and she didn't want me to cook because no one wants me to cook. But this was her frustration. She would come home, and she would say, here's the problem. I know you can't cook, but the kitchen is a mess. There's stuff all over the place. There's dirty dishes. I've got to spend the first 20 minutes cleaning the kitchen, and then I can start cooking. You can clean the kitchen. You can clear the clutter out of the kitchen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, you can clean the kitchen. Oh, this is important. (laughs) Tell them on the other side. Tell them, you can clean the kitchen. Everybody in Fairborn, you can clean the kitchen right now. She said, you can clean the kitchen. I know you can't cook. I know you can't make it, but you can clean the kitchen. And if you clean the kitchen, I can do the work faster. 
if you will set the table, you can trust that I'm going to have a meal prepared before you that you want. But you're asking me to do everything instead of taking on what you were called to do, what you are able to do in this moment. Do we see this? Are, are, are you tracking with me? This is what happens. Bartimaeus hears Jesus is passing by and he needs his coat to beg. He needs this protection. He needs it to collect. It is who he is. And he hears Jesus is passing by and he goes, I'm not gonna miss him. I'm not gonna miss his work in my life. And so he yells and they shush him and he yells a little bit louder because he goes, I'm not gonna miss it in this moment. And then Jesus calls him by name and he's still blind and he still has need to beg and he still can't see. But when Jesus calls him by name, it says in verse 50, Bartimaeus, he jumps up and he throws aside his coat, not healed, still blind, but he knows Jesus is coming, and he throws aside his coat because he knows he doesn't have need for it anymore. This is my call to you today in this moment. Your kitchen is cluttered. Your kitchen is cluttered. Your life is full of things that should not be a part of your life, and they're fine, and they're good, and you're not gonna find anything in scripture that contradicts them. And you're gonna go to people around you and they're gonna say, no, you're fine, you're good. You're just like the rest of us, slightly unhappy, desperate for something more, but barely making it through the day, wondering what else God could do in your life. And you go, you're fine, but I want you to know today, your kitchen is cluttered, and Jesus is passing by, and it's time to throw off the coat. It's time to get rid of what used to define you. It's time to get rid of the habits and behaviors that have no place in the new life. And everyone around you will go, no, 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 you're fine. No, you're good. No, make your excuses, but you know, it's a crutch. You know God is calling you into something deeper. You know Jesus is calling you into something more in this moment. And so today is the day that you go, no, 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 no. I can't make myself be healed. I can't make this happen in my life. Only Jesus can make this happen. But Jesus is walking by and he is calling me by name. Jesus is walking by and he is calling me by name and I am not going to miss what he has in my life. And so today I throw down the coat. Today I get rid of what was for what could be. Today I get rid of what used to define me because I know God is doing something new and more in this moment. I don't need my excuses. I don't need the sympathy of those around me. I don't need my excuse for why I haven't stepped forward because I don't need crutches anymore. I don't need to prop myself up with comfort. I don't need to use fear as an excuse for why I'm not following God because what God has for me is better because his victory is my victory. And I know there's someone in this room today. I know there's someone in Fairborn today. There's someone watching online today. And you know the mess that is in your kitchen. And you need to go in this moment, I'm gonna clean it up. I'm gonna get rid of what shouldn't be there because God has something more for me in this moment. And this is what I wholeheartedly believe. That once you have had some of God, you'll want all of God. Once you've had a taste of him in your life, you say, I'm not satisfied with just a little bit. I'm not satisfied with a little bit of Jesus. I want all of him. I want every bit of him. And what we do is we move throughout our days making excuses for why things are the way they are. We, we move throughout our days making excuses for why we don't have more faith, for why we don't trust more. And this is what we do. We compare ourselves to those around us and we look around. I go, well, I'm fine. They're doing this. I'm fine. 
I'm not asking what God is calling them to. What is God calling you to? Like, where is God leading you in this moment? And for me, I, I want the faith of Bartimaeus that when Jesus heals and he gives me permission to go, when Jesus heals and he gives me permission because I have already experienced a miracle that I don't settle for the miracle. I want the new life. I don't settle for the moment when God offers me eternity. I don't simply want salvation when he's given me freedom forever. And so I look at the coat and I go, I, I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't need to be propped up by a crutch. I don't make excuses for why I'm not moving forward. some of you you're stuck and you're not stuck in despair you're not stuck in destruction you're stuck in fine you're stuck in my life is okay and God called you to more than that Jesus didn't die for you to be fine Jesus didn't die for your life to be okay. He died for the fullness of what he has promised you. And it's for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. It's for the joy set before him that Jesus walked through the difficulty so that he could experience the full joy that God had promised you. And I want you to know that God has joy set before you that you would know his freedom, that you would know his healing, that you would know his power, that you would know his grace. And there's one part of your life that wants to hang on to what was, that wants to hold tight to what everyone else is doing, that is far more concerned about what's happening in the lives of those around you than where God is leading you. And you're held back by a crutch, and it was fine, and it was good, and it was okay in the moment. But you need to have the resolve within you that says, I want more of Jesus than that. I used to be filled by my addiction, and now I am filled by his grace. I used to be filled by what used to define me, but now I am filled by what he has done for me. Tell your neighbor in this moment, say, I don't need the crutch anymore. I don't need the coat anymore. God has more for me than that. God is doing more in me than that. God has promised more in my life than that. And so I'm not settling for good enough. I'm not settling for fine because that's not why Jesus died. He promised more in my life than that. Let's celebrate that together, church. My goodness. Celebrate the glory and grace of God and what he has promised for us and what he seeks to do in our life. So this is what I believe as a church. I, I, have, I have watched as your pastor, God transform people's lives. And, and we use that word lightly at times and we don't, we don't always feel the significance of the moment of what has actually happened. And we've seen people. We've seen people move from death to life. We've seen marriages that could have never been restored. God restored them. We've seen people who were stuck in addiction find freedom. We've seen people who had no hope all of a sudden become the hope that others needed. And I don't want you to miss it. I care about you too much to allow you to be more concerned about what was or what those around you think than what God has for you in this moment. I care about you too much for you to be more concerned about the comfort of your life than the grace of our Lord Jesus. And so every week we invite you to pray a prayer together. And we define it as our prayer of salvation. 
our prayer of initial acceptance of the grace of God and his mercy in our life. And it goes like this, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, that he was raised from the dead to forgive my sins. I receive your grace by faith. Come into my life, I will follow you. Amen. And today we're gonna pray a different prayer. That prayer is an initial acceptance of what God has done. And it's that moment that we are saved. But God doesn't just seek to save you, he seeks to sanctify you. He seeks to make you holy and fully his. To take every part of your life and every emotion that you have and direct it towards him. And so today we're going to pray what we're calling a prayer of sanctification. And this is what the prayer is going to be. Lord, I yield because we don't just choose Jesus. We say, God, every part of me, I yield to you. I follow you from there. Lord, I yield to the power of your spirit in every part of my life. Resurrect what should have never died. Remove what should have never lived. Reshape my desires, reform my understanding. Pour out your love over me that Christ would be in everything I see, in everything I do, in everything I desire, give me a passion only for you. Make me holy. Amen. And I want to tell you this, and I don't, I don't want to say this too heavy, but I feel like I do need to say this accurately. If you ask God to get rid of the coat, he's going to remove it. You understand that? You may not even know what it is. But if you ask God to get rid of the thing that is holding you back, he is going to take it. And I have no qualms of initially saying, I want everyone to pray the prayer of salvation. I want every single person to accept God's grace in your life as an entry point. But I, but I wholeheartedly believe that the prayers that we pray are dangerous. The prayers that we pray are dangerous. No matter what you pray, anything you give over to God, he will use for your good. But it may be painful in the moment. Jesus suffered on the cross for the joy. Do not think you will never suffer. Do not think if I turn it over to God, it means everything's gonna go easy. He's working for your good, not your comfort. He's working for your joy and your sanctification, not your ease. And so this is what's gonna happen today. In just a minute, the band is gonna sing a part of a song over us. We're not gonna stand, we're not gonna participate, they're gonna sing it over us. And I want you to ask and I want you to think, am I ready? to pray that prayer? Am I willing to see the fullness of what God has for me? You may know exactly what your code is and the excuses that you've made. You may have no idea what it is that you've been holding on to. But I'm gonna invite you in just a couple minutes to say, Heavenly Father, not a little bit of me, not a part of my life, every bit of it, all of me, is yours. I want your victory in every area, even if I don't know what that looks like. I want you and all of you because I trust you. Let me pray over you this morning. Lord Jesus, stir our hearts, lift our affections, raise our eyes, lift our gaze to you struggles and circumstances and difficulties and behaviors and habits of our lives can so easily drop our focus and lower our expectation. Father, give us the confidence and courage to believe that even before you've healed us, we don't need what used to define us. Even before you have given us the new life that we can see, we don't need to cling to what hinders. We don't need the crutch. 
So give us the confidence to turn it over to you, open-handed, full of praise, because we know anything you give us and anything you take from us is still for our good, because you are good. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus.